We have a ship D-Stack flight license update and a lot of booster movement for upcoming flights. My name's Ryan Caton and this is your Starbase Update. One of the first things to happen this week was the rollout of Booster 10 to the Massey's test site on top of the new thrust simulator for boosters. We previously speculated that Booster 10 was already outfitted with engines for testing on the OLM as soon as Booster 9 flies, but it seems that SpaceX is using the additional time they have well by assuring quality and stability of the booster. The booster has previously completed a cryotest campaign at Massey's, but with the new booster thrust sim, they will now be able to simulate forces on the thrust section of the vehicle to mimic flight-like forces whilst on the ground. Ship 26, meanwhile, is currently calling the suborbital test area home as it had the lifting squid attached to its nose once again. This does not mean removal from the stand and the slow roll back to the production site, however, as they tend to do this once they want to open the tanks to perform work inside. Since they can't pressurize the vehicle when the tanks are open, obviously, they give it additional stability by attaching it to the lift crane. Over at the new high bay slash mega bay slash whatever you want to call it bay, more work is going on up at the final level, which will most likely feature another top area just like the mega bay next door. In terms of height, the full height has been reached and cladding is going up step by step to make the vehicle assembly area as protected from the elements as possible. Over at the rocket garden, work continues on what? Ship 20? What year is this, 2022? Ship 20 saw some crane lifting points being filled by tiles. The reason for this is incredibly unclear. Friendly reminder, Ship 20 was the ship originally supposed to fly on Booster 4 for the 420 stack. That was later changed to 724. It is certainly interesting that SpaceX is performing work on it. Maybe some training or testing work so as to not ruin current operational vehicles perhaps? Ship 31 continues to be worked on as the ship common dome section was rolled into the high bay for stacking. Yep, we're into the 30s now. To say the high bay is occupied right now would be an understatement, with many ships in there undergoing many different phases of construction. You can also see in this section how most of the thermal protection system is already installed, with only the top and bottom weld area remaining bare metal. Booster 11 then also started to move as it returned back to the Mega Bay. It was previously stored at the Rocket Garden. This is most likely to prepare it for its pressure test campaign at the aforementioned Masseys. Booster 11 did not feature Raptor engines at this point as it is even earlier in the test flow than Booster 10. What SpaceX could do here is combine the pressure and thrust test into one step, meaning that B11 could only have to roll to Masseys once. We'll just have to wait and see. Booster 11 was then hooked up to the giant bridge crane at the top of the mega bay and lifted on top of the Booster 10 stand, which is now freed up since Booster 10 left the mega bay. Once it is ready, we will need to pay close attention to see if it will be placed onto a new rollout stand or if it will be readied for thrust testing. But for now, Booster 11 just has to wait. At the Rocket Garden, Ship 28 remains situated beside scaffolding with an open tank. It's being tethered to a crane for stability. It appears that it won't be relocated anytime soon, even though the testing area is currently occupied by Ship 26. We can also gain an unusual perspective of the ring yard at this point since the mid bay no longer blocks the view. Among the visible parts are Booster 14, Ship 33 and Ship 34 rings, along with other unidentified or unclear components. In this image of the Deluge tank farm, there's a noticeable decal featuring a goat with an X logo. This image is in reference to the SpaceX team and carries a playful reference to another interpretation of goat, signifying greatest of all time. Moving on to the Star Factory, more and more components of it are nearing readiness. As Jack noted two weeks ago, a section of it is already in use, with dome flips and sleeving operations taking place in the vicinity. Roof sections are also being delivered. The positive aspect is that this expansion will enhance production capabilities for assembling rockets in cleaner environments. However, the downside is that we'll witness fewer visible operations, as they're no longer happening outside. <coughs> Nevertheless, some parts of the Star Factory are still in the process of preparation and are not yet operational. The sheer size of this factory is truly immense, as it will accommodate a substantial amount of Starship construction. 
Consequently, constructing it naturally requires time, particularly with a fully operational rocket shipyard in close proximity. At this point, it's important to address a common concern, the presence of dents on a ship. These dents, which can sometimes alarm people, are actually a normal occurrence that we've observed for several years. This phenomenon is particularly noticeable when ships are not pressurized, such as those with open tanks. They tend to develop these dents, but once pressure is reintroduced, they return to a smooth surface. If you're eager for more booster-related updates, you're in for a treat. Stacking for Booster 13 is currently underway, taking place on the right side of the Mega Bay. Unfortunately, it's consistently challenging for us to get a good look at that corner, but you can see here how a section is being repositioned for stacking. Initially, it was placed in the middle and then shifted to the right side for welding. Speaking of boosters, Booster 10 underwent testing at Massey's. This marks its second test at Massey's following its initial campaign in July of this year. SpaceX conducted this test in a somewhat nerve-wracking manner as only the methane tank was fully fueled, while the LOX liquid oxygen tank remained under pressure. This approach briefly brought back memories of SN3 for some experienced observers. Afterwards, the frost line receded and it appears the test was completed. Confirmation of this would typically involve a return to the production site. Don't gaze at the colossal ship in this frame, direct your attention to the road. An SPMT, self-propelled modular transporter, was transported to the launch site for the impending movement of an object later in the week. These elusive vehicles can sometimes be challenging to spot, but you can just discern it, almost resembling a centipede on the road. You can observe here what was subsequently relocated. A ship stand was moved closer to the orbital launch mount, providing our initial clue with some information regarding what was in store. The process of disassembling Booster 9 and Ship 25 commenced, prompting a considerable amount of confusion within the community. It was then time to disassemble the ship and booster. This was accomplished using the chopsticks, which grasped the ship and detached it from the first stage. The initial step involved the retraction of the SQD, or Ship Quick Disconnect, creating the necessary space for disassembly. Initially, you could witness the SQD itself retracting, followed by the entire arm. The lifting procedure itself proceeded swiftly without much fuss. SpaceX has improved its efficiency with this procedure, and they almost appear routine at this point in terms of how they execute them. So some of you now may be thinking, especially those of you who watched Dasa's explainer video the other day, that this is a flight termination system D-Stack and the launch is imminent. Well, sadly, that's not really the case. While this D-Stacking process will ultimately lead to the installation of the flight termination system and hopefully its activation, Kathy Leaders, the SpaceX Starbase general manager, confirmed during a regional event that the flight is still two to three weeks away. This delay is due to ongoing FTS work, regulatory requirements, and a few remaining outstanding tasks. This footage was captured by Gene from Space Padre, so make sure to give him a follow on Twitter. The FAA has also issued a statement regarding the second flight of Starship. This statement reaffirms that SpaceX conducted a thorough investigation into the mishap under FAA oversight, and the investigation has been concluded. However, SpaceX has not yet obtained the license for the second flight. To secure this license, SpaceX will need to demonstrate compliance with all safety, environmental and other regulatory prerequisites. The FAA has also confirmed that they will review new environmental information for the second flight. They will conduct a written re-evaluation of the 2022 Programmatic Environmental Assessment, which includes consultations with the Endangered Species Act and the Fish and Wildlife Service. All of these factors together imply that SpaceX's Starship second flight does not currently have a flight license. Additionally, I'd recommend you watch the video I mentioned earlier, the video we released last week about when Starship might take flight. It's not as straightforward as one might assume and numerous factors come into play if you wish to plan your visit to Starbase around the launch. DAS has created a video addressing these indicators with all of the information you could ever need. Now, what are your thoughts on the current launch situation? Currently, the prevailing expectation leans towards October or later, but time will tell. Perhaps the regulatory matters can be resolved more swiftly than what is currently being let on. For now, thanks for watching and goodbye.